Okay, it's Christy Gunston, Mayor of Glenorchy City Council here, and welcome to tonight's council meeting on Monday, the 28th of September 2020. Before we begin tonight's meeting, I'd like to acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal community, the original, traditional, and continuing custodians and they are gathering on tonight in our various uh, places, uh, and acknowledge their, their leaders, past, present, and emerging as well. Tonight's meeting is being presented to you via Facebook uh, through the meeting with Zoom. We have our Alderman in attendance. We do have two apologies tonight. We have an apology from Alderman Angela Wine and also an apology from Alderman Peter Bull. But I'll go around the table, uh, the virtual table, and just check in to see who is here as well. Uh, Alderman Dunsby, are you with us tonight? Yes, good evening, Mayor. Good evening. Alderman King. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Evening, Alderman King. Deputy Mayor Thomas. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hello. Uh, we have Alderman Gary Richardson. I'm here, yes. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Fraser. Yes, I'm here. Alderman Carlton. I'm here. And Alderman Sims. Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. So move on then to item two, which is confirmation of the minutes from Open Council meeting for the meeting held the 31st of August 2020. So I have someone to move and second this item, please. Alderman Richardson, move. Happy to move. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. Someone to second, please. Alderman Dunsby. Thank you, Alderman Dunsby. Any discussion of the minutes? If there's no discussion, I'll put the motion. If you can please indicate for or against when I call uh, out your name. Alderman Dunsby. For. Alderman King. For. Deputy Mayor Thomas. For. Uh, Mayor Johnston is for. Alderman Richardson. For. Alderman Fraser. For. Alderman Carlton. For. And Alderman Sims. For. That's carried unanimously. Uh, so move on then to uh, seek to reorder the agenda item uh, as indicated by the general manager earlier today and myself. Uh, item 12, uh, we're seeking a motion to move item 12 to the closed section of council meeting. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Move Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Someone to second, please. Alderman Richardson. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. Uh, does anyone wish to speak to the motion? If not, I'll put the motion. Uh, Alderman Dunsby. For. Alderman King. For. Deputy Mayor Thomas. For. Mayor Johnston is for. Alderman Richardson. For. Alderman Fraser. For. Alderman Carlton. For. And Alderman Sims. For. That's carried unanimously. So we move then, as I say, on to item three, which is announcements by the chair. Uh, I do have a, just three items to discuss tonight. And many of you be aware that I'm a fan of our local football scene and that we always champion the wins when we have them at Glenorchy. And I'm really pleased to say that over the weekend, we had quite a successful uh, weekend. The Glenorchy under 17 girls beat New Norfolk. Uh, by two points and are now heading into the grand final. So congratulations to the under 17 girls there. But also the, uh, the under 15 boys at Glenorchy won their grand final by four points and congratulations to them. It was a very big weekend for the Glenorchy District Football Club this weekend when their uh, much favourite player, Jay Bowden, announced that he'll be retiring. He played his last game yesterday. Uh, Jay wears the jersey number 32 and I'm sure many people in Glenorchy have enjoyed watching him participate. Uh, in football for many years. Jay, uh, Jay has played 243 games, I believe. I think it might have been the 244th game on the weekend. He's picked 550 goals in his time. Uh, he is the six-time winner of the Roy Kazali Medal for Best and Fairest. He led the club's goal kicking six times. He's a life member of the Glenorchy District Football Club and also the TSL. He's represented Tasmania seven times. He's a three-time winner of the Alastair Lynch Medal three-time winner of the Peter Hudson medal. He's been named in the TSL Team of the Year nine times. Jay is a legend on the field. I'm sure many of us have enjoyed watching him and, and seen those great marks he's made and those great goals he's picked to save the day for Glenorchy many a time. And we do appreciate his effort on the field, but also uh, as a great community participant and, and representative of the area as well. Jay has certainly been fantastic, uh, particularly the young people in the area and really has inspired many people. So. Congratulations to Jay on a stellar career, uh, local football, and we wish him all the very best moving forward. 
Uh, so item then four, we move on to is the plenary interest notification. Do any alderman or any staff member present have a plenary interest on tonight's agenda? Mayor, uh, it's the general manager here. Uh, I'd like to declare a pecuniary interest in item 24, um, general manager's KPIs for 2020-2021. Thank you very much, general manager. That's noted. Any further pecuniary interest declaration? We'll take silence as noted. So we move on to item five, response to previous public questions taken on notice. There are none, so we move to item six. Public question time. Now, normally when we're able to have uh, members of the public present in our council chambers, we would open it up for public question time and people can ask questions from the floor. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, that's not possible at the moment, but we have received um, some questions via email from Mr. Shane Alderton from 296 Main Road, Austin's Ferry. Uh, Mr. Alderton writes, can council please explain when an alderman declares a pecuniary interest in an item or motion, why is the reason this alderman is declaring an interest not made public at the meeting? So rate payers and citizens have a better understanding as to why an alderman has declared an interest. I'm going to ask Council Executive Officer Rin Hannon to respond to that question, please. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor. Um, it, it's not something that the aldermen are required to expressly explain other than that they are under the Act required to state which item they're declaring a pecuniary interest in. Um, I'm sure it's a case of if you wanted to check with any individual alderman what the nature of their interest was, then that they would be open to that, but you would obviously have to check with them. Thank you. Mr Alderson, Alderson also asked, is the reason an alderman has declared a pecuniary interest documented anywhere that it can be easily obtained for public viewing so rate payers and citizens have a better understanding as to why an alderman has declared an interest? Thank you. Through you, Mayor, the, um, the register of interest is available on request. We're required to and do make that register available um, to members of the public. Um, we can certainly go back and, um, and uh, ask Alderman to update that register with whether the nature of their interest was pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest or a simple conflict of interest. Um, and of course, in, like the answer to my previous question, you would be open to write um, to the alderman or, or call the alderman and ask what the nature of their interest is. Um, so if Mr Alderson would like a copy of that register, we can certainly supply it. Thank you, right. So there is a difference between a pecuniary interest and a conflict of interest. And some aldermen may be declaring a conflict of interest where there's no pecuniary advantage or there's a money to be obtained. Yeah, look, that's correct. And and we, we have started recently um, um, confirming that on the minutes, whether someone declares a pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest um, or, or a simple conflict of interest. Um, that hasn't been the case uh, in the past, and it's certainly not a requirement of the Act. It's, it's obviously a requirement to declare a pecuniary interest. Um, our, our aldermen tend to go above um, and declare conflict of interest in that pecuniary interest section in addition to at the time of the actual motion um, or item that they're considering. Um, so going forward, it'll be easier to identify that and we can certainly make that information available retrospectively. Thank you. Uh, and then Mr Alderson finally asked, Alderman Fraser has gone on public record stating he supports exploring council amalgamation to committed. Can I ask Alderman Fraser a question through public question time as to why he has not put a motion to council seeking a discussion with that of exploring council amalgamation? Alderman Fraser, would you like to respond to Mr Alderson? Sure, happy to. Um, probably two things I'd say in response to Mr. Alderton's question. Uh, I, you know, the issue of amalgamations, in, in my view, is something that needs to be led by the state government. So um, I'm not sure what shape and form any potential motion at the council level would take. Um, potentially a, a motion to petition the state government to facilitate some sort of discussion with our neighbouring councils uh, might be useful, might be appropriate. Um, and it would at least signal uh, the council's openness to reform and change that might potentially benefit our community. Um, but the second point really is that, you know, the, the views I expressed in the Mercury uh, were my own. Um, and as an automatic team, we've not really had an opportunity to have any sort of in-depth discussion on this issue. I'm not even sure if I've managed to get anyone to second any potential motion on the issue at the moment. So I'm, I'm not interested in, in political stunts. Um, what I am interested in is well-informed uh, discussion on the issue, and so perhaps a better starting point might be to have to might be to have this on on the agenda of one of our upcoming workshops, so we can hear everyone's views on the issue. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel and Fraser. Now, those are the only questions we received uh, for public question time. So we'll move then on to item seven: petitions and deputations. And we haven't received any petitions 
uh, since our last council meeting, but we have received a vegetation request. Uh, and I'm welcome to the meeting, uh, Meg Webb, NLC, member for Nelson. Welcome to our meeting, Meg. Uh, I understand that Meg is here to discuss with us uh, pokey machines, and we can see from our council agenda that we do have an item in relation to gambling uh, on tonight's agenda. So I'll hand over to Meg to speak for about 20 minutes uh, of the, re the requirements of our deputation that Meg can speak, but unfortunately, Alderman we can't ask questions uh, of Meg at this time, um, but I'm sure that Meg would be happy to take anything up later on after the meeting, uh, any questions that you might have. So Meg, I'll pass over to you and thank you very much for joining our meeting. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Johnston. I really appreciate the opportunity to provide a deputation on this topic, knowing that it was coming up on your agenda for discussion. And, and I'm sorry that it can't be an interactive um, discussion. Uh, and what I will try to do is cover quite a bit of ground um, in what the remarks I have for you. Um, and I apologise for skating through it quite quickly, but I want to make the most of the time to try and provide you with some some good information and useful information for the consideration that you're giving to this topic as a council. Um, some members may have heard me speak on this topic already and I apologise if you hear some similar things. Uh, just to provide context for those who may not be aware of why I'm interested to speak to you about this uh, matter is uh, while I'm a member of the Legislative Council now, prior to being elected last year, I worked for 20 years in the community services sector. And the last 10 years of that was in social policy advocacy and research within the community services sector. And my job just prior to being elected was as manager of Anglicare Social Action and Research Centre from 2015 to 2019. And in that role, I was particularly involved in policy, research and advocacy on the, the issue of poker machines and effective regulation of poker machines in this state. So that's just to declare very clearly that that's my background and the, the basis on which I'm talking about it now. It's just something I'm still very interested in as a member of the state parliament um, and continue to talk about in the public domain. So the things I'm gonna talk through, as I said, I'm gonna whiz through them relatively quickly. And I apologize that we can't have questions to clarify anything as I go, but I'm more than happy to pick up afterwards with anybody who would like to hear more. I'm going to, at every instance that I can, identify for you where I'm providing you with information from research or data or where sources are required. So I'll try and do that. If I miss something and you want to follow up with me about a detail, please do so afterwards. I can provide sources and, and um, where I've uh, gained any of the um, claims or the data that I use or um, the assertions that I make. So that's just to clear the decks before we start. And we're talking today really, I guess, because you in Glenorchy, where, where you're located, uh, you're really ground zero in this state when it comes to poker machines and to the harm that they cause in the community. Uh, you've got the highest concentration of venues in the state in your LGA and the highest losses to poker machines. So it's a really topical matter for you to be giving ongoing consideration to. Um, in fact, just, this, um, just, just in the recent days, we had figures come out for the August losses in Glenorchy and they had really skyrocketed. Um, it's post-COVID skyrocketing, which we can talk about a bit later in my presentation, but you've just lost another $2.16 million in August to poker machines in your municipality. That's up 24% on August last year, where it was $1.74 million. So um, it's timely for you to be considering this. What I thought I'd do is talk through fairly promptly a bit of an overview to contextualise poker machines in this state and an un our understanding of um, what they are, how they work, um, and what the impact of them is in terms of use in this state. I'd like to talk about um, the, the uh, matter of poker machines compared to other forms of gambling and the sorts of things people might be thinking or, or wondering about that. I'd like to talk about um, the impact uh, in terms of employment in our community to do with poker machines. And I'd like to talk a little bit about, in particular, because it comes up quite often, um, the, the relationship or not between poker machines and online gambling. So that's what I'm planning to cover. And I hope that that provides you with information across a range of areas that are of particular interest to you. So just to contextualise first, uh, where we're placed in terms of poker machines in this state and in fact in this country. So Australia, except for Western Australia, uh, has an approach to poker machines that's entirely different to everywhere else in the world, basically. 
uh, we regulate them very differently to the way the rest of the world and Western Australia regulate them. We have a disproportionately high number of poker machines per capita. We've got a style of machine that's used in this country that's called, that's a high intensity machine that presents particular challenges to do with addiction and problem gambling. And we've got, as a result of those two things, a really high level of harm in this country that's just not seen anywhere else globally and not in Western Australia, where they have quite a different model where they only have poker machines in Western Australia in their one casino in the state. So that's a model that, that is very similar to the rest of the world, um, but very dissimilar to Tasmania and to other Eastern seaboard states of Australia. So even though Australia only has 0.3% of the world's population, we've got close to 20% of the world's poker machines right here in Australia. If we think about poker machines that are outside of casinos and destination gambling venues, so poker machines that are put in community um, pubs and clubs um, and community locations, Australia actually has 76% of the world's poker machines in those non-casino locations. We are absolutely aberrant in the way we deal with this product here. So it's important to understand that with that and with the fact that per capita, the only places that have more poker machines per capita than Australia are gambling resort destinations, places like Macau or Monaco or places in the Caribbean. We are absolutely different to every other similar nation to us when it comes to this product. We use poker machines that are high intensity. They're particularly designed to be more likely to cause addiction, to trigger addiction. And as a result of that, evidence suggests that in this country, because of the nature of our machines and the prevalence of them, we've got about one in six people who sit down in front of a machine to use it as it's intended to be used, becoming addicted. That's a conservative estimate. It's from the Productivity Commission and their investigations into this. The sorts of features of the machines that are really relevant to addiction are things like spin speeds, bet limits, maximum jackpots, uh, near misses and losses disguised as wins and the return to player rate. All of these things are programmable. All of them are choices we make and other countries make different choices. And I'll give you a really quick example of that. In the United Kingdom, venues that are right embedded in the community, little community clubs that have what would be poker machines, regarded as poker machines, they have very, very low maximum bet limits. 17 cents is, is the, uh, the rate that they have for their bet limit. And they have jackpots of $14 as a maximum in those very community um, located uh, venues. They also have poker machines in pubs in the UK. And those ones have a maximum bet limit of $2 and a maximum payout the equivalent of about $200 Australian. So again, really low. For Tasmania, we have $5 bet limits and we have maximum jackpot $25,000. But just to give you a bit of a sense of the difference, the way that different countries deal with this and Australia is quite, quite different. And it matters because it matters to the addiction, levels of addiction and it matters to the levels of harm. About half the, the money that goes through poker machines here in Australia and in Tasmania comes from people who are addicted or classified as at, at risk. Half the money that goes into them comes from people who are being harmed is what that means. And there's a very um, straightforward reason for that. Uh, people become addicted to poker machines quite readily. It's actually a chemical addiction. So when you press a button on a poker machine, it's actually the moment of anticipation that occurs while the machine is spinning and the, the results are not yet there when we're anticipating the results. In that moment, dopamine is released in your brain. And for some people, that becomes a chemical uh, reaction in the brain that is an addiction. So the pressing of the button releases the chemicals in the brain while you anticipate the result. And that addiction becomes a chemical addiction that's set in place in your body. It's, it's likely the reason that uh, gambling addiction, poker machine addiction is one of the only things, um, it's the only non-substance addiction that's actually in the DSM as in terms of a mental health diagnosis. Um, and it's because it does actually trigger a chemical reaction and a chemical addiction in the brain. We can modify the features of the machine that cause that. We can modify the likelihood that people will become addicted to that effect. Um, I mentioned some of those things before. The way that we could modify them by having lower maximum bet limits, slower spin speeds, 
um, lower jack maximum jackpots. We could do things like have timeouts on the machines after certain usage. All of those sorts of things are programmable and all of them would virtually not impact at all on people who are using the machines recreationally. It would simply impact on the likelihood of triggering addiction and the harm that's caused for those who may have uh, a problem with their gambling use. So let me just talk a little bit about how many people are affected by poker machines in Tassie. Uh, we tend to draw on data that is gathered every three years in um, Tasmanian government funded research, which is called the Social and Economic Impact Study of Gambling in Tasmania, the SEIS. So the last one of those was in 2017. And that told us that in the 12 months prior to that, about 18.6% of the Tasmanian adult population had used poker machines. So just under one in five of us had used poker machines. Interestingly enough, because people often have assumptions about who it is that use poker machines, interestingly enough, 18 to 24 year olds, that was 24% of 18 to 24 year olds. So a higher usage in that age bracket. We don't typically think of younger people using poker machines, but actually they're some of the higher users of them in this state, according to that um, 2017 government research. Now, of the people who are using them, what we do know through that research is that 0.6% of Tasmanian adults are categorised within that research as problem gamblers. 1.4% on top of that are classified as moderate level risk and another 4.8% as low risk gamblers. Now, that doesn't mean that they're at low risk. It means they're already in a risk category that's characterised as low compared to moderate compared to problem. So a total of 6.8% of Tasmanian adults, according to that study, are at-risk gamblers. That's at least, just to give you a proper picture of that, that's at least 27,000 Tasmanians in those at-risk groups, low, moderate and problem gambling, according to the government's research. But let me tell you why that's actually not an accurate picture. It's because it's at least that many. This is uh, research that is uh, accepted by the researchers themselves as an underestimate. In fact, we had um, a really well-regarded prevalence study expert called Sarah Hare from Queensland's Schottler Consulting, who does exactly this sort of research, talk about this in Hobart last year at a national conference, um, the National Association on Gambling Studies Conference. And she participated in a discussion about these prevalence studies and how accurate they are. She earned her money doing these studies, so she certainly says they're valuable, but she acknowledged that they're actually a serious underestimate. And I think that's very important to acknowledge here because claims that only, for example, only 0.6% of Tasmanian adults are problem gamblers are actually absolutely wrong. All we can say is at least that many. And here's why, because the surveys that gather this data are done uh, by phone and it's a cold call and people are asked to spend about 20 minutes responding to questions about their gambling. They need to provide uh, information about every form of gambling they participate in. Um, I don't gamble, so if it would be a very short conversation if I answered that survey. I'd just say, no, 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 no. So I sort of think of it, um, I give myself an example of, that would be meaningful to me. And I think, well, imagine if I was doing a survey of that sort related to an activity I do undertake, let's relate it to drinking alcohol, for example. And this is what the prevalence study questions would look like in that context. Others might find that an easier one to connect to as well. I'd be on the phone, I'd be asked, can I participate in a 20 minute study? And then I'd, they'd start asking me questions. They'd say, how often in the past year have you had an, had an alcoholic drink? How many times did you drink each week? How many times did you drink at home each week? At the pub, at a restaurant? How many drinks would you usually have each time in each of those locations? How much did you usually spend each time in each of those locations? Um, I think you probably get a little bit of a picture there about the fact that it's pretty hard with that sort of self-reporting to be entirely accurate with your data. So certainly me, when I go to the GP and the GP asks me how many drinks do you typically have in a week, I find myself squirming a bit and probably under-reporting. And it's similar to this, actually, the intensity is there in this questioning that people tend to under-report. Um, from all the answers that people give, they're categorised. They're either categorised as a non-gambler, a non-problem gambler, or in one of those three at-risk groups that I described before. So what you can imagine is, I think, for somebody who has a distinct problem with gambling, 
you'd find it pretty difficult to engage with that survey. You'd find it pretty difficult and stressful to be answering the questions. And you'd probably find it pretty difficult to answer the questions honestly. Um, so Sarah Hare, that prevalence expert who was here at that conference, national conference last year, talking about this very topic, she agreed with the premise of that discussion that it's highly likely that, that problem gamblers would get distressed answering questions in those surveys and would probably hang up and refuse to answer the questions. And in fact, we do get quite a high rate of hang up in the, when the surveys are done. So that's a long winded way of talking you through, but I think it's an important one to understand when people do tend to downplay the prevalence of this issue, they're doing that on the basis of data that is absolutely recognized by the people who actually collect the data as a significant underestimate. Another way we can think about how big a problem is this is we can think about um, how many of us know someone with a problem gambling on poker machines. And we did some surveying through Anglicare back in 2016 and asked that in an EMRS poll of a thousand Tasmanians around the state, do you personally know someone with a problem gambling on poker machines? And one in three respondents said yes. So I think that's another perspective into how prevalent this issue is. The sort of impact that, that poker machine issues have on gamblers is really straightforward. You can imagine it. It's financial first and foremost people dismantling their life really in response to uh, uh, the, the addiction they have using poker machines. People lose jobs, people lose houses, they lose families, they engage in crime. It can really drive problem behavior in all sorts of directions. Around that there's intense feelings of distress and shame and hopelessness and sense of failure. Uh, people find it very distressing because they believe that it's their fault that they don't have the willpower and the self-control when actually the reality is they've got a chemical addiction that's been triggered in their brain and it's not a matter of willpower and control when it comes to a chemical addiction in your brain. There's a whole other level there that isn't about your character. It isn't about whether you've failed or not. It's just about you happen to be one of the one in six at least who sat down in front of that machine and became addicted to it. Around people who have an addiction to poker machines, the Productivity Commission's research into this area tells us five to 10 other people will be being harmed by that addiction. And the 2017 SEIS, the Tasmanian Government Study, says things like, because they looked into this aspect of it too, and that study said, on average, affected others are much worse off due to someone else's gambling. And they said gambling is producing strong negative effects for people surrounding the gambler. So even if we took our underestimate of 27,000 Tasmanians who are in those three at-risk categories, and then we put five to 10 people around them, each of them who are being harmed, we're beginning to be see at a low ball figure that there are tens of thousands, if not into the hundreds of thousands of Tasmanians who become affected by this issue. The interesting thing is we don't uh, evenly spread this product around our state. We put it in areas that are low socioeconomic areas typically. We cluster it in, in suburbs and towns that have vulnerability when it comes to uh, stress, economic stress and personal stress. And it just so happens that we know through research that the presence of stress in someone's life, whether it's economic stress, personal stress of some sort, Grief is a really common one, a stress around a, a grief that's been experienced. Those things are risk factors for developing addiction. So when you want to uh, make the most of your financial opportunity of getting income from people who are addicted to poker machines, you put those poker machines in areas where people will be highly likely to be experiencing stress. And low socioeconomic areas are an easy target. Now, some people are, regard poker machines as being just another form of gambling. And they ask, well, what's the issue? You know, why do we have to treat them differently than other forms of gambling? Surely people should just be let, let alone to pursue whatever gambling they, they wish. Here's the reality. The gambling help services in Tasmania that provide support to those who come seeking support for their gambling, 80% of the people who come to those gambling support services have a problem with poker machines. 
The SEIS from 2017, the government's research, says that the strongest risk factor for gambling harm is using poker machines. That's what that says. Problem gamblers, it, the SEIS tells us, are particular, have particularly high levels of participation using poker machines. For moderate, and, for moderate risk and problem gamblers, poker machines are the gambling activity they are most likely to do. So the government's, Tasmanian government's own research tells us poker machines are the highest risk and they cause the most harm. And we know that through what we see in the support services. It's confirmed by the 80% of people coming to those services who have poker machines as their primary form of gambling and harm. The SEIS also tells us that pubs and clubs are the location in which people most frequently use poker machines and where the most harm occurs. So that tells us, that confirms actually the Productivity Commission figure. The SEIS also says that half the money going into Tasmania's poker machines are coming from people who are moderate risk and problem gamblers. So people are already actively having a problem with their gambling. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the impact um, or, or the relationship between poker machines and jobs. Because I think that's one that people often have questions about and, and wonder about. Do we need poker machines for jobs? What would happen if we were to adjust the way we regulate poker machines? Um, what would happen with jobs and employment? So the productivity, again, the Productivity Commission, specifically in its research, found that the impact of the gambling industry on employment is neutral. Because if the gambling industry didn't exist or was smaller, money would be spent in other industries and employment would be created in those other industries. So we, what that tells us is we could literally take the gambling industry away and, and remembering that the bulk of the gambling industry for us is the poker machine industry in terms of the harm and the addiction. We could literally take the gambling industry away, poker machines away, and the reallocated spending would create the same or more jobs elsewhere and would replace those that may, may disappear as we transitioned that industry or shifted that industry through regulation. That's also been reinforced by local research. So in 2017, um, Anglicare commissioned a, uh, an independent economist from Queensland, Professor John Mangan, who works with the, um, the University in Queensland, uh, to do an economic modeling around what would happen if we took poker machines out of pubs and clubs. And that report modeled three scenarios, sort of uh, um, th three different um, scenarios to do with taking poker machines out of pubs and clubs. And every single one of those scenarios, even the most pessimistic, found that we have a net gain for this state in jobs and in gross state product. So uh, what, what, would, what that means is that if we made that shift, when you take into account a shift in spending to other uh, other industries and other um, uses, and you take into account the harm that isn't being caused, um, and you also take into account what happens with government revenue as well, all those things that that modelling showed we come out in front, taking poker machines out of our pubs and clubs. Victorian research um, would tell us probably some of the reasons for that. So we know um, that for every million dollars spent on a poker machine, you get three jobs, three. For every million dollars that you spend on beverage service, you get eight jobs. For every million dollars you spend on food service, you get 20 jobs. So that's really telling. Money spent in poker machines is not job creating money. And money spent on poker machines is likely to be displaced spending from other parts of the hospitality industry, such as beverage service or food service. And they, that, that spending, money going into those locations, absolutely would create magnitudes more jobs than money spent on poker machines. It's interesting because the modelling that was done by Professor John Mangan for that um, Anglicare commissioned research and the government's own SEIS that was done in 2017, the, the state government funded um, independent research and work done by another independent economist here in the state, John Lawrence, who's from the Northwest of Tassie and investigations that were done through a site called The Conversation, which is an academic um, site and through RMIT's ABC Fact Check, all in 2017, all looked at the jobs created by poker machines in Tassie, because it was very topical at that time, as you would appreciate, leading into the 2018 state election. All those sources that looked at this issue and looked at all the data available around it agreed. They all agreed that the level of jobs 
that were directly created by poker machines equated to about 240 full-time equivalent jobs in this state, across the whole state. That's to do with operation of poker machines in hotels and clubs. And then there probably were another 40 or so jobs on top of that that would be to do with technicians, that's about seven jobs, and another, and to do with network gaming, which is the um, organising um, regulator around the pubs and clubs. Now, those jobs that say between 250 and 300 jobs are important jobs. They're all highly important for those people who've got them. But the thing is, they're not, having poker machines isn't necessary for those jobs to be created. What we know from the Productivity Commission is if we removed the gambling, that spending and those jobs would shift elsewhere. So we'd be neutral. We wouldn't be losing them if we adjusted this industry. We'd just be shifting them to elsewhere. Then there's things like peripheral jobs that people would bring up at times. And that's things like um, the cleaners and the delivery drivers and the suppliers that all interact with businesses that involve poker machines. Something to be really clear on is that in our state, about 74% of the pubs in our state don't have poker machines. So mostly that industry is pokies free. And all of those pokies free parts, the three quarters of the industry that's pokies free, is also all interacting with cleaners and delivery drivers and suppliers and all those peripheral jobs. So if the pokies related pubs um, were to shift their business model because we decided to, for example, take poker machines out of our local suburbs and to not have pokies pubs, then presumably those pubs would shift to a model, a business model that was not unlike the other three quarters of the industry that don't have poker machines. And they'd continue to support those peripheral jobs. Um, it, it's, it's important to realise that just because we're shifting and moving an industry potentially through regulation or through different public policy choices, we're not necessarily losing something. We're shifting something and changing something. And in many instances, instances creating the opportunity for something new to emerge. People sometimes talk about, in terms of poker machines, that, that those who have got issues gambling with poker machines may just as easily transfer that to another form of gambling if poker machines weren't there. Um, and I think that that's you know, something commonly that comes into people's minds. And it's one that's really important to, I think, investigate a little bit and look at what research does tell us. Um, I've heard people say, you know, if people are really determined to gamble, then they'll find a way to do it. And, and I would challenge that in the first instance by saying being determined to gamble is a different thing to being addicted to, to gambling and particularly to poker machines. Most people who have an addiction to poker machines would not say they're determined to gamble. They'd say they have an addiction. It's a chemical addiction that's triggered in their brain. Um, what are, what's interesting is that most research would indicate that it's a false assumption that a, in particular a poker machine addiction will transfer to another form of gambling. That's because it's really specific. It's specific, it's specific to the design of the machines. It's specific to that mechanism of that moment of anticipation. It's specific to the social context of the machines as well. We've had research which has indicated that that's not replicated in most other forms of gambling. So it's not something that readily transfers across. In fact, TASI um, government research itself actually, one of the SEIS has looked at this and, and it found that less than a quarter of the people who have a problem with pokies would be likely to transfer to another form of gambling. Um, and we've also been able to look at other countries that have removed poker machines uh, from their communities. And we can see that actually online gambling, for example, or other forms of gambling didn't increase as a result. So I think that so far, what we can, from what we can tell, people don't transfer readily from a poker machine addiction to a different gambling addiction. I think it's interesting for us to have a think about what's happened during COVID and what's happening now. So when we first entered the COVID period, we had shut down and we had uh, all machines switched off and venues closed. And during that time, it was 13 weeks, um, based on last year's figures, we've saved, we had $44 million saved from poker machines, staying in people's pockets. Um, what was reported by people then uh, who have issues with poker machine gambling was that it was a massive relief. They didn't have to battle every single day as they went around their community or as they just were managing their COVID experience. They didn't have to manage their addiction because they had no choice about it. What we don't know is, and this is what people ask about, whether people who had a problem with poker machine gambling going into that shutdown period 
changed their gambling uh, and went to other forms of gambling during the shutdown. Anecdotally, what's being heard in the first instance is that they didn't. Um, people have noted though, that for example, online gambling appeared to go up during that shutdown period. And mostly people then make a big jump and say, oh, that must've been the, the pokies players going to online gambling. The thing is at the moment, we have no evidence that that's the case. It's being looked into. There'll be plenty that comes out in, in time to come around that and we can pick it apart and have a good look at it. But right now, we can observe that potentially online gambling did go up during that time. Uh, we don't know whether that was people who were already using that form of gambling increasing their use. We don't know whether it was new people coming to it. And we, if it was new people coming to it, we don't know whether they were coming to it from other forms of gambling or coming to it fresh. We just don't know yet. We can't say. I've read one paper from the Australian Institute of Criminology in their statistical bulletin number 27. And that showed that when they um, did surveying in March and then again in April, so further into the shutdown, they found that people were, fewer people were participating in online gambling in April than they had been in March and that they were betting, but they ones who were participating were betting more often and spending more. So um, I think we really need to unpick that pattern. What we do know going into that shutdown is that losses to pokies in this country were out, um, outweighing losses to online gambling by huge magnitudes. In, nationally, it's about 12 billion to do with pokies and it's about 1 billion to do with online gambling. So, so much more pokies losses. And we certainly didn't see online gambling jump to fill that gap between those two um, uh, amounts. Um, I realize I'm speaking at you a lot in a big long flow, but I just wanna get through the key things while I've got your, your time. What's happened now is pokies have reopened. Pokies have reopened and uh, what we've seen is entirely predictable because we could look actually to the not too distant past and see what happened when we were facing the GFC about a decade ago. So when we had the GFC and there was stimulus money going out into the community to try and keep things moving along, what we saw then was pokies losses shot through the roof, shot through the roof. And there's probably two reasons for that. One is that there were risk factors in terms of the community were under stress, particularly economic stress, but personal stress too. And people had extra money in their pockets through government stimulus payments. Now, exactly the same sort of set of um, conditions were in place now during COVID, if not more so because we also had health concerns and health stress over the top of it. And initially we turned poker machines off during the shutdown and we were protected from any impact there. But when we turned them back on, we've seen kick in exactly that same scenario we saw play out at the GFC. We've seen um, losses spike uh, above pre-COVID levels. Um, we have to assume that um, people who've had access to some extra stimulus support, whether it's job seeker or job keeper payments, whether it's they've accessed their superannuations, have to assume that there's some of that that's going into poker machines now with those spikes in losses. Um, that's a shame because that money could be more economically useful to us in other ways, spent almost in any other way, actually. It would be more economically useful to us as stimulus. Um, so not only are we getting the potential harm caused by the poker machine use now, we're also getting uh, an undervaluing of our economic stimulus efforts um, through the losses. So it's a real shame that, that we've put ourselves into that position we didn't need to. Um, I put it to you that in your local community, looking at the losses we've just seen for August, two point, um, uh, what did I say, $2.16 million in the month of August for Glenorchy, that that money could well have done much better use for your community and your local businesses and your economic situation there if it had been spent almost anywhere else than in poker machines. And unfortunately, we didn't allow for that to to happen because we had them turned back on with no consideration given to the social or economic um, value of doing that. The state government didn't assess the social or economic risk of turning poker machines back on. They just looked at the health and hygiene matters around it. And I know that because I did an RTI request to ask what assessments were done and it came back that there were none. I think that's covered off on most of the areas that I thought might be of most use for you to think about. Um, the upshot is, in summary, in your community, poker machines are 
tangibly causing harm on a social and, and personal level to members of your community. They're causing, it's causing um, economic harm uh, because it would be better, that money would be better spent almost anywhere else in your local community. There are various ways that we could reduce the harm caused by poker machines. Um, we could do it most effectively by doing what most of the rest of the world does and put them only in casinos and destination gambling venues is the way that that's generally described. Uh, that would be the most efficient and effective way to immediately cut the harm, particularly in local communities like yours. The other way we can also attempt to reduce harm is through addressing and regulating better the features of the machines. So some of those things I talked about earlier, maximum bet limits, spin speeds, maximum jackpots, um, those sort of things. That's entirely in our um, power and ability to do as well. Uh, so as a, as a council, there, those are two um, ways forward that you can think about in terms of being advocates for your community and in terms of being um, picking up a role in, in giving voice to the best interest of your community to advocate going forward, that, that we don't have to accept the level of harm that's caused now. We can tangibly reduce it. And there's a, a, a number of avenues to that, but it takes decision making and it takes the community being listened to and being advocated for. So I absolutely encourage you to, to do that um, and to maintain the stance that you've had as a council, which has been a really strong one and it's been really representative of your community until now um, in terms of reducing the impact of poker machines. Thank you very much, Meg. I really appreciate that thorough deputation you provided. And again, apologies that the format of this means that we can't ask you questions. I'm sure Alderman have got questions, as I'm sure members of the public are, uh, who have been listening to it through our Facebook page. But um, thank you very much for that very informative um, and detailed and oh, research. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate right. the opportunity to provide the deputation and thanks for your time. Thank you very much. And it's item 11, so you're more than welcome to stay on Facebook and listen to item 11 in the debate. But thank you. We'll, we'll ask you to leave the meeting now. Thank you very much. So we then move on to item eight, Alderman, which is announcements by the Mayor. Uh, do I have someone to move this item, please? Move, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Someone to second, please? Yeah, Alderman King. Thank you, Alderman King. Deputy Mayor, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, thank you, Mayor. You've had another <coughs> month that there's more events and things happening now um, and back into the swing of things. I don't have any questions. Happy to open it up to the floor. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'll ask uh, Alderman Dunsby any discussion or questions? Nothing from me, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Alderman King. Uh, no, nothing, Mayor. I'm not used to my name coming up so quickly. I've got to be ready for this. You've got to be ready on the trigger button there for your mute. <laughs> thank you, Alderman King. Uh, Alderman Richardson. Uh, no, that's fine. Alderman Fraser? No, I'm fine, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Carlton. Uh, nothing further, thank you. Uh, Alderman Sims? No questions, thanks. Thank you, I'll go back to the mover, Deputy Mayor then, anything to conclude with? No, thank you, Mayor. I'll put the motion then, if you can please indicate for or against. Alderman Dunsby? For. Alderman King? For. Deputy Mayor Thomas? Four. Mayor Johnson is four. Alderman Richardson? Four. Alderman Fraser? Four. Alderman Carlton? Four. And Alderman Sims? Four. Passed unanimously. Item nine, Montrose Foreshore and Gibbons Reserve final place-based designs. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Have Alderman Dunsby. Thank you, Alderman Dunsby. Someone to second, please. Alderman Carlton. Thank you, Alderman Carlton. Alderman Dunsby, would you like to speak to the motion? Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Obviously, we're just receiving and noting the consultant's report and we can see more practically what's going to be included. There have had to be some items taken out or delayed, but we note that they uh, still be planned for in the future if some funds can be obtained. I think this is just going to make a wonderful impact for all across our community, not just for children, but it's going to be 
you know, people engaged in these play spaces of all ages and really looking forward to seeing them moving forward as fast as they can. And I'm happy to throw it open for discussion. Thank you very much, Alderman Dunsby. Uh, Alderman King, would you like to speak to the motion? Oh, I'm very happy with Alderman Dunsby's comments, Mayor. I think she's covered everything beautifully. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Thomas. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I'd like to speak to this exciting motion um, and pleased to see the final designs come to us for endorsement. Um, it is disappointing that unfortunately costs blow out and, and things from initial sort of designs and community consultation stages um, have, have needed to be removed. Um, in particular, I note the removal of the labyrinth at, at Montrose um, uh, for sure, which, which I was really quite excited about, but I know that there'll be a space there to, to add that back in later down the track, hopefully um, when we get have some more funding to do that. Um, uh, but uh, what I, on a positive note, uh, you know, Giblin Reserve is going to be Tasmania's first capital I inclusive uh, play space, and which will mean that not only can people come who come to the park, um, everyone will be able to not only get around things but use the, the equipment. You know, so it's um, I think it's uh, that will be a real asset for our community. Um, and Montrose uh, will have the largest sand and water play zone in Tasmania. So. Um, you know, it's, it's a really exciting, um, something that we've heard a lot about in our community for years, years and years, and um, it's going to be fantastic. Um, I did note also in the report that there are, there you know, car parking is a concern for both, in particular car parking and the, um, the intersection at Montrose will, will, you know, is potentially an issue and there's an issue that community members have raised. So um, I noted in the report that it did say that we have written to the Department of State Growth um, and asked whether there's capacity to um, upgrade that intersection. So a question I had was whether we'd had any response to that as yet or whether those on um, discussions are ongoing. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I ask the Director of Instruction Works, Ted Ross, to respond to that one. Ted. Uh, through, through you, Mayor, I haven't heard of any uh, response that we received um, unless Neil, uh, the, the, pro, uh, the project manager, Neil Ames, is here as well. Neil, have you got an update on that? No, we certainly haven't received a response from the state. Thank you, Ted, and thanks, Neil. Anything further, Deputy Mayor Thomas? Okay, no, thank you, Mayor. I just look forward to, um, to hearing what that response is. And I know um, officers will continue to work on options in relation to the car parking and uh, look forward to tender going out and getting started on the construction. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor Thomas. Uh, Audubon Richardson, would you like to speak to the motion or any questions? No, I just, um, I just how exciting it all looks and uh, the, the uh, designs look good. Um, I just note that the, the, the original design that we were given has been modified a bit just to meet budget, but um, provision is allowed for that to happen further back down the track when we do get more resourcing. Um, I just want to comment that I am pleased to note that we are pursuing the state government regarding the upgrade of the intersection of Forshaw Road and Brooker because it's um, it has been a concern, um, a safety concern for years, especially um, the Montrose uh, from the uh, point of view of Montrose High School. So that that uh, that's good that we're pursuing that, um, and I look forward to to the completion of, of the, uh, the the spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. Alderman Fraser, would you like to speak to the motion? Only to say it's exciting to see the, the plans uh, finalised and I look forward to seeing it get built. Thank you, Alderman Fraser. Alderman Carlton, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mayor. I'm very happy to receive a note and also to um, endorse the final play space plans for both um, Montrose Park and Giblin Reserve. Um, very interesting reading through the consultant's report and feel really confident that um, there's been a lot of work going to really trying to understand what our community wants and um, that certainly comes through um, in, in the attachments tonight. So very happy to receive note and endorse and uh, look forward to work starting. Thank you, Alderman Carlton. Alderman seems to speak to the motion. Um, uh, I think most things have been covered by others at this point. It is a bit devastating to see some of those aspects drop off at this stage, but good to know they're in the future planning um, 
So it'll be um, good just keeping an eye on that and um, having a part of that moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Sims. Uh, I too am very excited to see this proposal come before us in the final designs. Uh, last week, I had the pleasure of having about 150 grade one and twos from Windermere, Bay Pri uh, Windermere Primary School sorry, uh, coming into council chambers to learn all about their community and about council. And we talked about some of the things that council have planned specifically uh, for young people and for little people. And they were really excited to hear about the proposals for both Montrose Bay and also for Gibbons Reserve. In particular, the Flying Fox was a huge win. So I'm looking forward to being able to deliver this project for um, the kids at Windermere Bay, the grade ones and twos, have a little bit more about what council does for their community and also for the broader community who I'm sure will get lots of use and enjoyment out of these improved spaces. Uh, so I'll go back to the mover then, uh, to move it, Godwin Dunsty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the one thing that I would like to add in closing the debate is the um, energy and passion that the project manager and other staff of council put into this project. They have researched, they've talked so much, they've had the same ambitions and passion for us for the things that have sadly had to be put on delay. But that certainly shows through in all the work that comes back to us and in particular these reports. So I'd just like to acknowledge their input into that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Dunsby. I will put the motion then. Uh, indicate for or against, please. Alderman Dunsby. For. Alderman King. For. Mayor Thomas. For. Mayor Johnson is for. Alderman Richardson. For. Alderman Fraser. For. Alderman Carlton. For. And Alderman Sims. For. Thank you. The motion is carried unanimously. Item 10, customer service strategy. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Deputy Mayor. Deputy Mayor, someone to second, please. Alderman King. Thank you, Alderman King. Deputy Mayor, would you like to speak to the motion? Well, thank you, Mayor. I'm happy to um, endorse the customer service strategy, um, setting out what our vision is as a council for outstanding customer service, and not only as a council, but as a community. Um, we did uh, we did put the draft strategy out to our community for feedback. Um, I did note we got generally a, a quite a um, low response uh, from our community. Hopefully that indicated that um, they were really quite happy with the high level sort of strategy and I, and the actions um, set out to be implemented over the next five years. Um, and I think perhaps also what the community cares about is that we just get it right um, in, in our customer service. So, you know, having it written in a document is one thing, but the, the actual experience on the ground is what matters to our community. Um, I'm confident that the actions set out to be implemented over the next five years um, will improve the experience for our uh, community, uh, including processes to close the loop, something that's really important and that we've had quite a few conversations about um, as a council automatic body around how important that is for people to um, to to uh, get a response to their inquiry and then, you know, um, not just get the job done, but let them know that it's been done and what's been done. So that's really important. Um, Modernising payment options, improving our website, reviewing our customer service centre. There's a really um, sort of extensive our list of actions included in the plan to be to be undertaken across our council directorates, recognising that customer service isn't just something that is confined to one department, and it is at the interface of everything that that we do across our um, our teams at council. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing about progress, which I note will be reported uh, in the quarterly in each quarterly report. Progress towards those actions, and then more comprehensively. Um, annually to council. So happy to open it up to the floor for discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Alderman Dunsey, would you like to speak to the motion? We have Alderman Dunsey there. We might uh, skip ahead then to Alderman King. No, thanks, Mayor. It's pretty straightforward. Thanks. Uh, Alderman Richardson. Uh, no, no, I'm, ha I'm happy to support the adoption of the, of the uh, strategy. That's fine. Uh, Alderman Fraser, would you like to speak to the motion? No, I'm happy to adopt it and just uh, to say that this has obviously been a big part of someone's life for quite some time. So recognise the time and effort that's gone into creating it. Thank you. Alderman Carlton. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just echoing Alderman uh, Thomas's 
um, points where we talk about customer services more than um, one department. And I think this document really reflects that through uh, the action plan in that it, it is um, looking at customer service or customer experience across the whole um, the whole organisation. So I'm very happy to, to have that come um, in front of us tonight. Thank you, Alwyn Carlton. Alwyn Sims. Uh, yes, it's a great piece of work and it was um, um, good to have an input into it through the workshops and um, having a really good active contribution. I think when it comes down to it, in short, it, it's communication and follow through. And it's not to say our staff weren't doing it, um, but getting those great outcomes, it's really important that we bring the community along and have that communication coordinated and linked up in this way. And I think that'll communicate better to the public as well. And they'll feel like that their needs are being met at the same time, which is just as important as actually us getting down and doing the job. It's all well and good for us to know, but making sure they know and that they feel like um, they've been facilitated. So this is great to see. I look forward to it in action. Thank you, Alderman Sim. We'll go back to the mover, Deputy Mayor Thomas. Thank you, Mayor. Probably just to echo what Alderman Sim said, we do have a team of very dedicated, um, friendly, helpful staff at council and um, uh, we are uh, we recognize that and appreciate that as does our community but we are committed to continual improvement and that's certainly what this um, strategy demonstrates so happy to support it thank you very much i'll put the motion then uh, i noted that alderman dunsby has stepped out i'll just check to see if she's in there alderman dunsby you have you returned no, so we'll note that Alderman Dunsby has stepped out at this point in time. Uh, Alderman King. Uh, yeah, four, Mayor, thanks. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Thomas. Four. Uh, Mayor Johnson is four. Alderman Richardson. Four. Alderman Fraser. Four. Alderman Carlton. Four. And Alderman Sims. Four. It's carried unanimously. So item 11 is sufficient for the future of gaming in Tasmania and the fifth social and economic impact study of gambling in Tasmania. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Move, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Someone second, please. Alderman Sims. Thank you, Alderman Sims. Deputy Mayor, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Although I'm not sure, sure I can quite do it. Uh, just as following on from the deputation, we received from the Honourable Meg Webb MLC um, earlier tonight, and I thank and appreciate, thank Meg for that deputation, appreciate uh, the comprehensive information provided. Uh, the proposal before us is that we uh, support or endorse the general manager making a submission on behalf of council to uh, the state government's future of gaming in Tasmania reform proposal, and uh, also to the fifth social and economic impact study of gaming in Tasmania uh, and further that we endorse council's position, uh, our statement uh, on our position on gambling, in particular pokey machines, um, electronic gaming machines in our municipality. Uh, and certainly the position outlined um, demonstrates a commitment to our community plan goals of making lives better, knowing our communities and what they value and supporting initiatives which address social disadvantage in our community. So supporting a, um, a removal of pokies in pubs and clubs in our municipality through a managed reduction over time uh, also aligns with uh, the current policy position of council, which we inherited as a council when we were elected in January 2018. And that was a position that was uh, developed by council back in 2016. Uh, the council at the time responding to community uh, community concern and community um, feedback provided through survey of our community members, which demonstrated around 80% of our community don't support pokies um, in pubs and clubs and would like to see them removed. We have um, 240 electronic gaming machines across eight venues in our municipality. Um, Six of these are owned either by the Federal Group or Vantage Hotel Group, which is a subsidiary of Woolworths. The strongest risk factor for gambling, uh, as for, for harmful gambling, as Meg Webb outlined earlier, is um, EGM play, electronic gaming machine, pokies. 
um, play. Um, and people are more likely to have a problem with electronic gaming machines when they are in local pubs and clubs, in local venues, than when they are in a, a casino. We heard of the staggering figure of over $2 million being lost in our, um, in our municipality in the last month. And that was matched by um, the July, that was matched in July, similar figures, over $2 million lost in our community, which could be um, more uh, helpfully spent and contributing to our, to contribute greater to it, to our economic development strategy um, and the development of business in our area if it was spent um, on alternative uh, things and in alternative businesses that are locally owned. Uh, we also heard that EGMs employ only three people for every million dollars spent and that, that you know, figure is much lower than the employment that is obtained for, through beverage or food service in hospitality industry. And I was interested to hear Meg also speak about the peripheral jobs. You know, people often voice concerns about what about the peripheral jobs, cleaners, um, but you know, as we heard, the majority of pubs and clubs in Tasmania don't have pokies uh, and they, of course, still employ cleaners. Um, look, I strongly support the removal of pokies from pubs and clubs uh, and I also support, uh, until they are removed, strategies to improve harm reduction mechanisms, strategies that Meg talked about, like slower spin speeds, lowering the maximum bet, um, not allowing false wins, importantly, and lowering jackpot amounts. We must also increase um, and improve harm reduction measures, measures and accountability of venues. And I can speak from personal experience as an 18 year old working in a pub that had pokies and just having done responsible service of gaming course, uh, which was required uh, to work in a pokies venue. I, I knew firsthand how difficult it was looking at the photos on the wall for people who had, who had applied um, to, for the harm reduction mechanism of self-exclusion, looking at those photos, thinking, is that that person? Uh, and not having the confidence or courage to go and ask, is this you, should you really be here? Those sort of harm reduction mechanisms just do not work. And I've heard stories of people who have said, they haven't kicked me out, I've self-excluded, I've just lost all this money, they don't ask me to leave. So the harm reduction me mechanisms we have in place just aren't good enough. And until we remove them, we must advocate for their, those mechanisms to be strengthened. I think that's enough for me to say for now. I'm happy to open it up to the floor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Audubon Dunsey, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you. Um, we've heard a very strong um, presentation from Meg Webb tonight, quite sobering in all the facts and figures that she's put before us. And then I think the Deputy Mayor has certainly wrapped up um, what's in our report and, and her views on that extremely well. I don't know that I can really add to it all that much, but some people might say it's not an area that particularly sits with local government, but we are concerned about the health, safety and welfare of people in our community. And we need to promote the best interests of our community. And I think this is where council can take a stand and, and address a significant issue that is impacting within our community. Um, there are so many aspects to this that need to be dealt with that it does need more support and engagement around it. And I certainly will be supporting the, the commitment of council going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Dunsby, Alderman King. Very hard to add anything to, uh, to the Deputy Mayor's dissertation there. Well said, indeed. Uh, other than I have seen the harm, I've seen the the response from the pubs and clubs, clubs being closed and the lack of defaults and hardship in our own industry over that period of time. And then things change again as soon as they open. Uh, there's a definite correlation with the two and I've witnessed it. So this is a start, it's a long road and you've got to start somewhere. I know we started this in 2016 and, and good on Meg for bringing it back. Uh, we'll do the best we can. We do represent the community and I feel we are being representative of the community with this approach. Thank you, Alderman King. Alderman Richardson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I've struggled with this one, I've got to say. Um, I, uh, and Meg's presentation, yes, I, I uh, appreciated Meg's presentation. Statistics do show that gaming is harmful. 
Um, but we've got to remember it is illegal. And um, I do struggle with, uh, I don't like gaming machines, not at all. Um, and, um, but do I have the right to tell people to make a choice? While it is legal, do I have a right to tell them not to gamble? Um, smoking is harmful. Drinking is harmful. Statistics show that. Um, I, um, the statistics should show that the harm it does, but we also have to listen to our community and we as aldermen represent our community and, um, and we have to listen to what our businesses tell us. I do, I have concerns about, I have concerns about, oh, sorry. We just have to ignore that sound. <laughs> I, um, I do have concerns about um, jobs being lost. I do have concerns about impact on our community if it's just directed at Glenorchy. Um, I, I do believe I, uh, that um, I totally agree with more money needs to be um, turned back into the community, back into community projects and harm minimization. And I definitely agree with the number of gaming machines in Glenorchy should be reduced and the $1 limit. Um, and, and the, but I think the government, the state government needs to step up with this one. The, the wording in the, um, the document um, worries me. I think it should have a state focus on it and not just a Glenorchy uh, focus so that our businesses aren't harmed in any way. Um, so uh, I think just a bit, uh, bit of wording needs to be adjusted there for that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Jordan Richardson. Horton Fraser, would you like to speak to the item? You're just on mute there, sorry, Horton Fraser. Yeah, no, I'm happy to support the statement as is. Thank you, Horton Fraser. Uh, Alderman Carlton, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you to my fellow Aldermen uh, for their comments um, that have already been around the table. I'll be supporting the two recommend recommendations tonight. Um, in, in regards uh, to our statement, um, you know, I think it's important to, um, to focus on the fact that what we're trying to present is what our ideal is. You know, we see future Glenorchy, what do we see in our community? And I think we all uh, look to the future and see um, a, a, a a community where, where there aren't pokey. So to me, it's really about expressing what our vision is for our community. And that is really based on our um, community plan, the conversations that we've had with the community. It isn't something that we can achieve on our own as a council, we acknowledge that. Um, but we certainly um, want to be able to express what, what that vision is and then uh, to be able to do the other aspects um, that we actually list on that particular commitment. Thank you, Alderman Carlton. Alderman Sim, if you'd like to speak to the motion. I would, thank you. This is one close to my heart. Oh, there's so much here to... I'm going to try and be succinct and quick. Um, I think a, most of it has been said. And to be honest, um, the type of forums and events and people I've spoken to who are, um, inverted commas, experts around this, which include Anglicare, and there's lots of people that are really passionate around research um, and then, you know, considering it holistically, let's be frank and realistic here. It's a systematic issue and it's a state government responsibility to a degree. We have a responsibility as a council to advocate for our community's health and wellbeing to state government. The responsibility links are there. Um, I get a bit sick of the argument that this isn't us, let's palm it off to state and then state do what they like and everyone's unhappy with the decision. We've got to take more responsibility as a community, lobbying our aldermen and our councils and our grassroots government so we can be empowered and confident as well to know what we need. It's not necessarily what businesses want and their opinion, it's us facilitating responsibly what we need for our community and our overall outcomes. It's a massive issue when um, Tasmania specifically has extremely sophisticated systems and frameworks that modify behaviour. The impact um, 
are what experts call hypnosis. It's a chemical reaction in the brain that's nothing short of irresponsible for a government to facilitate. It's devastating. And our community has one of the highest reliance on these at the moment. That is something we do need to consider responsibly as a council. Um, and the impacts, <laughs> hearing some of those stats from Meg, um, I really appreciate she's come along and shown an active interest in it and working with us at that level that we should be. And it's great to have her along um, to help, I suppose, outline some of those facts and some of the needs we have. But also, to be honest, someone who participates in this actively already, it's nothing I haven't heard before. They're alarming. They scare the hell out of me. But to be honest, we're still in the same position. Okay, someone's throwing facts at me. We're having forums around it. What are we going to do about it? We have a, a disjointed community around this and their opinions. And I think it comes down to working with them and educating them and making justified transitions. So these submission opportunities, um, we need to be lobbying for standards, regulations, laws, acts to change so we can better evaluate and assess these areas. But we need to bring the community with us, not scare them. We need justified progression. Um, you know, we need that transition supported for all stakeholders. And some of the facts that were um, brought up tonight are ones that are everywhere. Like people know bits and drabs of them. People know their experience of working in the clubs and getting paid by them. And they listen to their bosses. So there are mixed messages going out there that aren't aligned with facts. And sadly, our community, um, especially the ones involved that rely on that, um, do have justified fear around these kind of progressions and how we're going to do this. Because we've talked a lot about how we can fix it and rip them out and sort it, but we haven't talked a lot about supporting our community and all those different aspects. So, you know, 18 to 25 year old, 24 year olds, um, you know, having a really massive, you know, a quarter of a percent of that money came from their pockets. They can't afford it, but they're the biggest risk takers. That age group are going to do and engage in things like that if they're available. So I agree with cutting machines. I don't like them at all personally, but I think we've got to think about strategies for moderating and modifying the use. Also in balance with choice and freedom and those other aspects, but also highly focused on education and bringing that community with us. Um, yeah, there's a lot to be discussed around that. And I think what we've got up on the table today covers, can encompass what I've said if it is um, navigated in that way by our officers and our council at a strategic level um, and directed at where it's most prevalent. So I appreciate that and I'll be supporting the motion today. Thank you, Ivan Sears. I'd too like to speak to the motion and I want to thank all of them for their contributions to the discussion tonight and also thank Meg Webb, NLC member for Nelson Care's reputation where she outlined a number of important facts and debunked some of the common myths the urban myths around pokies. And we've heard a lot about the indisputable facts about pokies, the science behind them, the way they stimulate chemicals in the brain like no other form of gambling does, who makes money out of them, their disproportionate concentration in low socioeconomic areas such as ours, and the figures of how much money is lost in the throat of pokie machines in the Golden Mile, which we have the dubious title of in Glenorchy. It's all really important information to take into consideration, but I want to spend a moment talking about the stories of real people in our community rather than just facts and figures. One of the things about being a mayor is that often people feel comfortable to approach me and share some of their most personal stories with me. This has been the case more so since council took a firm position in 2016 that pokies do not belong in our pubs and clubs. I feel really honoured to be trusted with their stories and only share the ones I have permission to. Their stories of heartbreak, of hardship, families torn apart, homelessness and children going without. There are stories of businesses struggling to cope with the impact of staff members with a poking addiction. They are stories of social isolation and also stories of shame. When discussing this item today, I'm reminded of the elderly lady who told me that she was going cold in winter because she couldn't afford to put the heating on. She told me that her son was addicted to pokies and was taking money from her to play them. 
She was also desperately trying to support his young family by putting food on their table because the son was putting almost all of their household money into a poker machine. He, of course, would reassure her that he was just one click away from getting lucky and being able to buy the family whatever they wanted. But he never got lucky on pokey machines. I'm also reminded of watching children being dropped off at one of our local schools and then watching their parents walk straight from the school, right down the driveway, across the road to the pokies, and then stay there until it was school pick up time. These kids turned up at school hungry, starving. There was no money but at home for food, but there was always money to put in the pokies. I'm reminded of the small business owner who discovered that their dedicated long-term employee, a dear friend of theirs, had developed a pokey addiction and had been stealing money from the till to feed into the machines. The small business owner was struggling to stay afloat and was impacting on his family, causing them financial hardship. But the worst thing for him was the breach of trust and the feeling of helplessness as an employee, a friend was destroying their life through this devastating addiction. And of course, there is a tragic story from last week that was publicised where a person living in our community with a disability and a cognitive impairment went into the Elwick Hotel and put their lunch money in thinking that it would come back out again. When of course it didn't come back out again, she became distraught and sought help from the salvos. She couldn't understand how a machine could take money and then not give anything in return. Well, these are just a few of the stories. There are far more. I haven't even touched on the ones where people have told me that their pokies have caused such distress and harm that families have been torn apart. Or where people have ended up with a criminal record because they just believe the next spin is the lucky one and they just need to get money to put into that machine. Or where people get themselves into such debt and trouble that believe the only way out is suicide. It breaks my heart. I love this community and I know that every alderman sitting around this virtual chamber does too. I can't stand by and say nothing. These machines have been deliberately placed in our community to target the most vulnerable people. In preparation for tonight's meeting, I decided I would go to the Elwick Hotel this morning and see for myself what is happening there. I arrived at about 8.30 a.m. and have been open for about half an hour. The Elwick's opening hours are 8 a.m. to 4 a.m. every day. That's 4 a.m. in the morning. They're only closed for four hours a day. The Elwick is a jewel in the Farrell family crown. It is one of their best earners. I wanted to believe that on a Monday morning at 8.30 a.m., there would surely be no one in there playing the pokey machines. I wanted to believe it, but deep down, I knew that I'd be disappointed. I sat there for about 30 minutes watching, and I watched about 10 people put coin after coin into the machine, clicking the button. I watched them get up, and go to the cashier and their couple of coins ran out and hand over more money to get more coins back. I overheard them talking about how they must have got an unlucky machine, but they'll try the one three seats down because that looks lucky. It wasn't even nine o'clock this morning, on a Monday. The sun was shining outside, the start of school holidays and it felt like spring. But inside the Elwick, it was dark, there were no clocks, and all you could hear was the sound of money disappearing down the pokey machine. Our community deserves so much better than this. We look out and support each other where we can. That's what Glenorchy people do. That's what our council should be doing. The $22 million plus that goes into those machines each year in Glenorchy is a horrendous economic loss, and that's bad enough. But the human cost to our community and the people that live in it far exceeds this. It's sometimes easy to blame the individual to say that they should keep away from them or that they should just be made of stronger stuff. We have to take responsibility as a community for those in our community. We knowingly put people in harm's way. Heavens, we even encourage them and give them a free coffee so that they stay longer and spend more. As Meg outlined this morning, this earlier this meeting, in Western Australia, you won't find people playing pokies at 8.30 a.m. on a Monday morning in the suburbs because they can't. Pokies are only in casinos there. This is our chance as a council to lend our voice and stand with our community. To say enough is enough. We don't want to see the harm in our community. 
I really encourage my automatic colleagues to support this motion and in turn support our community. And I urge anyone at home listening to this via Facebook, if you know someone who's struggling with a gambling addiction or a poker machine addiction, or you have one yourself, then please reach out, help is available. Please contact the Gamblers Helpline. The number is 1800 858 858. That concludes my contribution to the debate. I'll ask the Premier if she'd like to close the debate. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to my colleagues for um, your contributions on this important issue as well. I just um, take the opportunity in closing to respond to uh, Alderman Richardson's um, to, uh, concerns about jobs uh, and, and go reflect again on Meg's contribution uh, where she told us that the Productivity Commission research found that the impact of gambling on jobs is neutral. Um, that in fact, the reallocated spending creates the same or more jobs elsewhere. Anglicare also did research that confirmed this, showing that the net gains, the net gain in jobs and also gross state product from removing pokies, there would be a net gain, sorry, in jobs and in, and in gross state product if we were to remove pokies from pubs and clubs. I also reiterate my point made earlier that six out of the eight pokey venues in our city are owned by big business. That money could instead be supporting our small locally owned businesses who have been struggling um, through the COVID shutdown and who our um, economic development strategy is trying to help thrive. It's important we recognise that addiction is not a choice. It is not the person's fault. It is a mental illness as defined in the DSM-5 created by the chemical reaction in the brain and the neural pathways that are created by the trickery of electronic gaming machines. Alderman Richardson is right. We do not have the right to tell people not to gamble. That's, that's true. But we do have a responsibility to minimise and where possible, remove the risk of harm. And that's what this motion is advocating for. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. I'll put the motion to the indicate for or against. Alderman Dunsby? For. Alderman King? For. Deputy Mayor Thomas? For. Mayor Johnston? For. Alderman Richardson? I am supporting the motion. Alderman Fraser? For. Alderman Carlton? For. Alderman Sims? For. That's carried unanimously. We'll move then on to item 13, Council's Cove Attender and Contracts 2020 to 2024. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Someone to second, please. Seconded, Alderman Carlton. Thank you, Alderman Carlton. Deputy Mayor, would you like to speak to the motion? Oh, thank you, Mayor. Just briefly, um, I'm just noting that uh, there's a, a couple of changes to the code to tender and contracts that we're endorsing tonight. Uh, one is in relation to the procurement threshold, uh, which will require uh, only one written quote to be obtained for procurements of $25,000 value or less, uh, rather than the current value of $10,000, which sort of reflects um, current practice. Um, and uh, there's a, importantly, there's an increased focus on supporting Tasmanian business. So of course, I'm all for this. Thank you. Thank you, great. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Alderman Dunsey, would you like to speak to the motion? Nothing to add, Mayor, thank you. Uh, Alderman King, would you like to speak to the motion? No, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Alderman Richardson, would you like to speak to the motion? No. Oh. Oh, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm here. No, that's fine, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Fraser, would you like to speak to the motion? No, thanks. Uh, Alderman Carlton? Nothing to add, thanks, Mayor. And Alderman Sims? No, nothing to add, thanks. Thank you. Well, there's no just further discussion. Deputy Mayor, did you want to add anything finally? No, thank you, Mayor. I'll put the motion then to the indicate for or against. Uh, Alderman Dunsby. For. Alderman King. For. Deputy Mayor Thomas. For. Mayor Johnston is for. Alderman Richardson. For. Alderman Fraser. For. Alderman Carlton. For. And Alderman Sims. 
Four. Carried unanimously. Item 14, Council Policy and Procedure Framework. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Alderman Dunsby. Thank you, Alderman Dunsby. Someone to second, please? Alderman Fraser. Thank you, Alderman Fraser. Alderman Dunsby, would you like to speak to the motion? No, I have nothing to particularly add. I think it's just bringing up to our contemporary style and um, will be the basis for all policies adopted from now on. Happy to throw it open for discussion around the table. Uh, thank you, Alderman Dunsby. Alderman King, would you like to speak to the motion? No, as Alderman Dunsby said, it's just pretty straightforward, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Thomas, would you like to speak to the motion? No, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Alderman Richardson, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, no, no, I'm all right, thank you. Alderman Fraser? No, thanks. Alderman Carlton? Nothing to add, thank you. Alderman Sims? Uh, no, very straightforward, thanks. Thank you. I'll go back to the movie then, Alderman Dunsby. Nothing further, Mayor. I'll put the motion then, all those you just indicated for or against. Uh, Alderman Dunsby. Four. Alderman King. Four. Deputy Mayor Times. Four. Mayor Johnston is four. Alderman Richardson. Four. Alderman Fraser. Four. Alderman Carlton. Four. Alderman Sims. Four. That's carried unanimously. Item 15 is no spray register policy. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Alderman Dunsby. Thank you, Alderman Dunsby. Someone to second? Alderman Alder. Sims. Thank you, Alderman Sims. Alderman Dunsby, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you. I appreciate the work of council staff in bringing this report back to us a month after I put a request forward for this. There's certainly been some lobbying in the community for people who are affected particularly by um, different pesticides to have this option in the areas where they live. I'm very pleased to see this policy here and coming forward. And whilst there hasn't been a lot of community consultation on it, it certainly gives the opportunity for people who are deeply affected by it to already be um, receptive of, the, of what this is going to be going forward. Um, again, I thank the officers for coming back so quickly and look forward to it being enacted as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alderman Dunsby. Alderman King, would you like to speak to the motion? No, I'm just glad it's been brought forward. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Thomas. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Just a question, if I may. I'm, I'm supportive of, uh, of this um, being proposed and of the motion, but I do note that it's not something that's in our annual plan and it will have a cost of $25,000 in the first year and $10,000 um, in subsequent years. That's an estimated cost. Um, I'm just interested to know, um, is this made up of HR or other costs? What are the costs? And um, uh, given it's not in our annual plan, does it mean we have to trade something out in order to, to, for this to go in? Or is it something that can be managed within existing resources on top of our other actions? I might throw to the Director of Instruction Works, Ted Ross, for that one. Uh, through you, Mayor, thank you for the question. Um, We've set out in the actual um, report what the, the costs um, are required for, including developing internal procedures, setting up ICT systems, um, promoting and advertising the, the register, undertaking administration, um, inspection of properties and so forth. Um, in terms of um, how, how that will be administered, well, we will need, I guess it's... A, the, the $25,000 we've estimated is, a, is an estimate of the effort. And while some of it um, might be able to be done you know, by existing officers, that there'll be definitely that type of impact from us taking on this activity. I'm mindful that if we, um, if we keep sort of saying that we'll do more things without explaining what the impact is, it, it, you know, we, we will have to look at our budget and other things. Um, in terms of finding the, the funding, that will be something I guess might might even be um, comments that you know Tina House might our um, CFO might want to uh, comment on that. Tina, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm assuming from thank you, Mayor, through you. I'm assuming from reading the report that most of it will be funded from already within the Infrastructure and Works Directorate. Um, with a redesignation of activities and or resources. Thank you, Tim. Uh, 
Uh, through you, I might just add that um, one of the reasons we've um, sort of shown this being adopted, um, you know, to commence on first of July, is so that uh, aldermen will be able to consider that impact on, you know, any impact on budget as part of um, next next financial year. Thank you, Ted. Anything further, Deputy Mayor? Uh, no, thank you, Mayor. I just think it's important that we consider um, when we're adding things in that potentially something has to come out. So it's always good to be aware of that. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Alderman Richardson. No, sorry. Nothing to add. Alderman Fraser. No, nothing to add, thanks. Alderman Carlton. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I note that this uh, type of register does exist with other uh, local governments. And I did have a question around um, the, the practicality of, of the register and actually ensuring that the, the register is fully implemented, what the experience has been with other councils and um, how confident we are that we're going to be able to do that with our resource levels. Director of Instruction and Works, Ted? Uh, yeah, th through you, Mayor, uh, one of the reasons we've uh, asked for a significant period to, before we commence is to make sure that we have those processes in place to ensure that we're compliant. So when we when we kick off the no spray register, we want to make sure that we're, we're not spraying in those areas. Um, it will require additional resources to, to consider how we do that, whether uh, we're looking at options to largely do it um, using GIS and handheld devices as part of um, how we manage both contractors and internal workforce. Uh, we're also looking at how other councils have applied it and they've, some of them have used markers to, uh, at properties to assist with, as a, I guess, a fail safe if, if um, your ICT systems aren't working. So uh, we're working and looking at what other councils are doing and learning from, from what they're doing. Thank you, that's all from me. Thank you, Alderman Carlton. Alderman Sims. Um, no, nothing more from me, thanks. I'm just glad to be moving forward with this and looking at health and wellbeing for our community. I do note that we didn't have a whole um, huge amount of consultation on this. And I think you do have to, you know, um, for lack of better words, Dems are breaks when you're prioritising consultation and the costs behind that and the time it takes, there are things that are quite clear that are evidence-based. And again, it comes down to the health and wellbeing and facilitating that for our community. So I think this is a responsible move and a step in the right direction. So I'm happy to support this. Thank you, Alderman Sims. I'll go back to the move then, Alderman Dunst, with place debate. Yes, thank you. I appreciate all the comments from around the table that have been contributed tonight. I note that this is predominantly something that um, members of the community will opt in for rather than something for general consumption, but for them to have that opportunity there, I think it's very much worthwhile as they consider their own health and wellbeing around their property and things like that. So very happy to see it um, coming to fruition, depending on the vote that's about to come. Thank you very much, Alderman Dunsby. I'll put the motion to indicate for or against Alderman Dunsby. For. Alderman King. For. Deputy Mayor Thomas. Four. Mayor Johnston is four. Alden Richardson. Four. Alden Fraser. Four. Alderman Carlton. Four. And Alderman Sims. Four. The motion is carried unanimously. Item 16 is the Child Care Connections Policy and Procedures Review. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Deputy Alderman Mayor. Sims. I thank you, Alderman Sims, and seconded by Deputy Mayor. Alderman Sims, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, yeah, I think I'd be on repeat every time these come up if I, I um, spoke to it, but it, it's in regards to childcare regulations and the national quality standard and framework. Um, and it's very common for this space to be moving up to modern practices. A lot of evidence-based best practice um, gets um, delivered out across services, and it's an expectation by the law that they work towards that and, and meet those outcomes for our children and the next generation. So I'm happy to support this one. I've had a bit of a look at the policies going through. Um, they're quite run of the mill when you work in this space and there was definitely nothing that was concerning um, from my point of view. So happy to support this. And well done to the team out there too, if anyone's listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alderman Sims. Uh, Alderman Duncey, would you like to speak to the motion? 
not got nothing to add on and the comments of all the seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Adam Donsby. Alderman King? Uh, no, no, thank you. Deputy Mayor Thomas? Uh, nothing to add, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Alderman Richardson? No, no, that's Alderman. fine. Thank you, Alderman Fraser? No, nothing to add. Alderman Carlton? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Nothing to add. Uh, Alderman Sims, which is closed debate. Uh, I don't think I have anything further to add, so I'll um, leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put the motion to impact for or against. Alderman Dunsby? Four. Alderman King? Four. Deputy Mayor Thomas? Four. Mayor Johnson is four. Alderman Richardson? Four. Alderman Fraser? Four. Alderman Carlton. Four. And Alderman Sims. Four. Carried unanimously. Item 17 is updated council policies. Do I have an alderman to move with the recommendation, please? Moved Alderman Fraser. Uh, moved Alderman Fraser. Come with a second, please. Deputy Mayor. Deputy Mayor, thank you. Alderman Fraser, would you like to speak to the motion, please? Uh, no, I'm happy to adopt uh, all of the uh, updated policies. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Dunsey, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, yes, Mayor. I'd like to foreshadow an, an, an altered motion that would remove item three as one of the policies to be adopted in this recommendation tonight. Um, I, I, I feel that we perhaps need to workshop that one just a little bit more. I know there's some issues that we want to clarify. And I think that'd be better to get the information coming from staff members in a workshop rather than in a council meeting situation. Not there's anything to hide and I'm happy for it to perhaps come back at a later time. So I'll just foreshadow that um, alternative recommendation. Thank you very much. Um, but as terms of that, I'm happy with all the policies that are there. So. Thank you. So I've just noted your foreshadowed motion there, Alderman Dunsby, uh, that your foreshadowed motion would be the recommendation minus uh, 0.3. I understand. Thank you. Uh, Alderman King, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, I'm at the same vein, Mayor. I'd like to agree with Alderman Dunsby's foreshadowed motion there to remove item three for the time being until next meeting so we can have a little bit more of a discussion on it, please. Deputy Mayor Thomas. Uh, I don't have anything to add. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Johnson, nothing further to add. Alderman Richardson. Yeah, no, I'm happy to support um, item 1245 and um, deal with uh, item three at a later date. Yes. Uh, Alderman Carlton. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I was trying to find my unmute button there. Um, I'm going to be um, the same as Alderman Richardson. Thank you. Alderman Sims? Uh, I'm happy with that. Thanks. Thank you. I'll go back to the mover then, uh, Alderman Fraser. No, nothing further to add. I shall put the motion as moved. I can indicate for or against. Alderman Dunsby? Against. Alderman King? Against. Deputy Mayor Thomas? Four. Mayor Johnston is four. Alderman Richardson? Against. Alderman Fraser? Four. Alderman Carlton? Against. Alderman Sims? Against. Uh, the motion is defeated. So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five votes against and three, four. So the foreshadowed motion uh, has been put. Uh, so the motion there is from Alderman Dunsby. You happen to second that? Uh, Alderman King, I think you indicated you want to second that one. Great. Thanks, Mayor. Yep. Alderman Dunsby, would you like to speak to your foreshadowed motion, which is just to clarify for the Mr. Public watching at home that Council adopt the updated traffic management plans policy in the form of attachment one, adopt the updated roadside directional signs policy in the form of attachment three, adopt the updated and renamed media and communications policy in the form of attachment seven and adopt the updated social media policy in the form of attachment nine. That's a correct, thank you, Mayor. 
Did you want to speak to that motion at all, Alderman Dunsby? No, I, I think that um, fairly self-explanatory that we feel that um, just needs a little bit more workshop on that particular policy that was previously mentioned, but I'm very happy with the policies outside of that that have come forward and that the recommendation that will become one, two, three and four um, going forward um, can be considered at this time. Thank you, Edwin Dunsey. Edwin King, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mayor. Um, no, I, I'm the same view. I just look forward to a little bit more discussion on item three and, and if the rest becomes one, two, three and four, that's ideal. Right, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I was supportive of all the uh, policies, obviously, uh, going forward, but I'm happy to hear uh, Alderman's um, discussion around the other policy uh, at a workshop with some solutions focus. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. No, I think Alderman Dunsby has covered my thoughts on it. Alderman Fraser. Uh, I must say, I don't really understand what, what the issue is, but um, uh, yeah, I'm happy if, if necessary to come back and talk about it in a workshop. That's what people want. Thank you. Alderman Carlton. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm happy to uh, support Alderman Dunsby's foreshadowed motion. Um, I think there is just a little bit more work that needs to happen on the Alderman expense policy. Uh, there's a little bit more discussion to be had, but very happy with all of the other, uh, the other recommendations, the other policies. Thank you. Alderman Sims. I'm happy to support this. Thank you. I'll go back to move then Alderman Dunsby to close debate. Uh, nothing further. Thank you, Mayor. I'll put the motion there to indicate for or against. Uh, Alderman Dunsby. For. Alderman King. For. Deputy Mayor Thomas. For. Mayor Johnson is for. Alderman Richardson. For. Alderman Fraser. For. Alderman Carlton. For. And Alderman Sims. For. The motion is carried unanimously. Moving on to item 18, procurements and contracts monthly report. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Deputy Mayor. Deputy Deputy Mayor, some to second. Alderman Richardson. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. Deputy Mayor, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just have a question, if I may. Uh, I, I note that $7,615 of the $9,659 of legal costs related to a Supreme Court matter uh, which involved a rates appeal. Um, I just wonder if it's possible to be advised of the outcome and whether council, if council won, will seek costs and that will be recovered. Uh, General Manager, would you like to respond to that one in the first instance? Um, Mayor, I would defer to the um, Corporate Services Director or the CFO. I'm, I'm happy to take you go, Jenny, sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. Um, I'm happy for you to talk about it, Tina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, through you. Um, yes, Deputy Mayor, um, we have a ratepayer um, who uh, lodged an appeal against um, a succession of collections we've been undertaking over a um, fairly lengthy period of time um, on the grounds that um, local government did not have the constitutional right to um, charge rates um, was the basis of the ratepayers' um, argument. Um, we were successful um, in the Supreme Court yeah. case um, just under two weeks ago. Um, we do anticipate that the ratepayer will appeal the decision. However, that is still pending, so he may or may not choose to go down that pathway. Um, we have um, added the costs, our legal costs, um, onto his debt, total debt owing council and are proceeding down the collections pathway with that one um, at this point in time. I think that answered it. <laughs> please please yes. let me know if it can cover everything. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Very unfortunate situation. Um, but, yeah, thank you. Anything further, Deputy Mayor? No, thank you, Mayor. Happy to support the uh, motion. Thank you, Alderman Dunsby. No, nothing to add on this matter. Thank you, Mayor. Alderman King. Just a question on that appeal, Mayor. I take it that we won't follow that up until the appeal's gone through. Is that, is that how it works? Just from a legal oh, yes. point? Of... 
<laughs> through you, Mayor. Um, um, we have added the court costs um, already on to the debt owing to council for the ratepayer um, and have recommenced collection proceedings. Um, not knowing whether there will or will not be an appeal lodged against the case. So we are proceeding um, uh, immediately to, um, as I say, with our collection procedures on that one. Um, in, in case the person, in fact, does not lodge an appeal, we will be um, yes, continuing our process. Thank you. Thank you, Arvind King. Uh, Alderman Richardson. No, uh, nothing good. Alderman Fraser. No, nothing further. Thanks. Alderman Carlton. Nothing further. Thank you. Alderman Sims. No, thank you. That's clarified everything. Thank you. I'll go back to the mover, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Nothing to add. Thank you. I'll put the motion to indicate for or against Alderman Dunsby. For. Alderman King. For. Deputy Mayor Thomas. For. Mayor Johnston is for. Alderman Richardson. Four. Alderman Fraser. Four. Alderman Carlton. Four. And Alderman Sim. Four. It's carried unanimously. Uh, so item 19, financial performance report, uh, 231 August 2020. Do I have someone to move this item, please? Alderman Richardson. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. Someone to second, please. Alderman, Alderman Fraser. Thank you, Alderman Fraser. Alderman Richardson, would you like to speak to the Four. motion? Uh, no, I'm happy to take the report as read. Um, I note that the uh, performance is better than budget, but that's due to timing issues. Um, so there's nothing there of a concern that concerns me. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. Alderman Darcy, would you like to speak to the motion? Nothing to add. Thank you, Mayor. Alderman King. Nothing to add, Mayor. Thanks. Deputy Mayor Thomas. No, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Alderman Fraser. Just a question. I uh, noticed in the report there were, well, there was nearly a quarter of a million dollars worth of additional employee expenses year, financial year to date uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, could, could we have some explanation for why, you know, where those expenses have come from, please? Thank you, Adam Fraser. Perhaps to Tina, our Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, through you, Mayor. Uh, yes, Alderman Fraser. Um, uh, we have um, reapplied the um, Council's pandemic leave um, for this current year in line with our approved 2021 budget. Um, that accounts for $228,000 um, of those additional employee costs. Um, should we discover towards the end of the financial year that that, is, that um, pandemic leave provision is not required, then that will be re-added back into um, um, the, the, the unspent um, funds of our employee expenditure line. So um, we are waiting with cautious optimism to hopefully not have a second wave um, and, in fact, not actually need that pandemic leave, but it is there as part of the approved budget um, at this point in time. Thank you. No, just thank you. Uh, Alderman Carlton. Nothing from me, thank you. Alderman Sims. No, nothing from me, thanks. I think I'll go back to the mover, Alderman Richardson. No, nothing, nothing, we move to the vote. Thank you, I'll put the motion to indicate for or against. Alderman Dunsby. For. Alderman King. For. Uh, Deputy Mayor Thomas. For. Mayor Johnston is for. Alderman Richardson. Four. Alderman Fraser. Four. Alderman Carlton. Four. And Alderman Sim. Four. It's carried unanimously. Item 20 is notice of motion questions on notice without notice in open council. Do any aldermen have any questions on notice or notice of motion without notice? A question without notice. Yes, Alderman Fraser. Um, and my apologies, I would have sent it in. Uh, with notice, but um, it was recently uh, on a council trip up through the Wellington Park area, um, looking at some um, flood uh, flood infrastructure, uh, and we couldn't help but note there's a huge amount of of well, it seems like to to a uh, to a novice that there's a huge amount of uh, fire load existing in the forest up there, a lot of dead uh, timber, a lot of logs on the ground. Um, 
And I, I wondered uh, what possibility is there to allow um, woodcutters to enter that, you know, that area uh, and remove cut firewood essentially and remove all the dead wood out of the forest. Um, it's potentially quite a, a valuable resource. Uh, wood, um, you know, firewood is in short supply and people have to go further and further out of the city to find it. Uh, it could be a win-win for all concerned. So um, that was basically my question. What's what's stopping us from doing that? Is it a possibility? Thank you, Oliver Fraser. Uh, Director Ted Ross might want to respond to that one or take that one on notice. Uh, through you, Mayor, I'm happy to um, answer that now. Um, um, wood hooking, I guess, is, is the common term for um, you know taking wood out of Wellington Park, and that's a it's not a permitted use. So, as part of the management plan for the trust, unfortunately, you know they they can't do that. Um, it, it's um, it's something that we could talk to the trust about whether you know um, that kind of activity um, could be permitted. But I'd suggest there's a quite a few issues, not only with um, work health safety, but also providing access and and a number of other issues. But I'm I'm happy to uh, at least ask the question of the trust to see see what they think. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like it might be more trouble than it's worth, but um, one day a fire will go through the forest and it will all go up in smoke anyway. So, um, you know, it seems like a good idea to, uh, to use the resource while it's there. Thank you, Alderman Fraser. Any further questions on us without notice? There's a motion for open council. If there are no further questions on items, I'll ask that for my move that we go to closed council, please. So move me. Thank you, Alderman King. Someone to second, please. Second, and Alderman Coulton. Thank you, Alderman Coulton. I'll put the motion, if there's indicate for or against. Alderman Dunsby. For. Alderman King. For. Deputy Mayor Thomas. For. Mayor Johnston is for. Alderman Richardson. For. Alderman Fraser. For. Alderman Carlton. For. And Alderman Sim. For. Carried unanimously. Thank you very much to members of the public for tuning in to our council meeting tonight. We look forward and hope to see you at our October meeting. The year is racing away very quickly. Please join us on Facebook and check out uh, Facebook for any updates from council in the meantime. So thanks very much for joining us.